be very careful when you handle these things. Welcome back to 1834 Restoration House. Last weekend, we made a little rookie mistake. Oh, are we regretting it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> So we come in the house today and there's this terrible smell permeating the house. I mean, it is bad. So uh, let's, let's take you back there and show you what happened. Those of you who do plumbing, you know where I'm headed with this thing. Okay, but for the rest of you, this is what happened. So this is the drain pipe. It goes out to a pipe that's under the house. It runs out to the sewer and that's where the water gets out of the house. But the problem is sewer gases will just very willingly come right back up that pipe and they'll come right into the house. That's exactly what happened. Now, if you recall from last week, we had something called a P-trap. And what that does is that trap holds water in it. Let me just draw on the wall here. So your, your pipe comes down like so, and then it turns around like that and it goes back up. And then it goes out and then off to wherever. Now, that, that bottom loop here usually fills with water. The water acts like a plug and it allows water to flow out but keeps the sewer gases from coming back up. Instead, every house has a vent stack that goes right straight up and out to the atmosphere. That's where the gases go up. So that way you don't get sewer gases in your house. Now, last week we were in such a hurry to go home because we were hot, tired, and it was a long weekend. We forgot to fill the P-trap. So this is what we should have done last weekend that I'm going to do right now. Now the P-trap is full of water and we won't have any more smell coming up. We may not have gotten very many magnolia blooms on camera, but look at these pink, beautiful flowers. So many. We were talking about these flowers on the way here, seeing them everywhere and wondering what they were. Saturday, Mike had to go up to North Carolina to get some work done up in the mountains. So today is Sunday and we're going to get these tools all cleaned up and then we're going to clean up the kitchen, get those mouse traps set, that's another thing we forgot last weekend. And we're gonna hopefully get the bathrooms all cleaned up too. Now that we've got it vacuumed, let's Swiffer this area. This is the second one. There's the first one. This is the only area I've touched yet. This is gonna take a while. I didn't look that dirty to me, but looks can be deceiving. Our goal right now is to get into the house so we can actually live here. And one of those things that we need is a laundry rack. Now, as much as I hate using a Chinese laundry rack, it's kind of a do-it-yourself thing. Um, it doesn't really fit with the ethics of what we're trying to do here as house restorers. But on the other hand, we still need to live here. So I'm gonna go ahead and assemble this thing. Oh, thank you. It took about five minutes to put this whole thing together. You know, they're cheap, they're flimsy and everything, but it gets the job done for now, which is what we care about. Eventually, we'll have better laundry facilities and we'll try to make something that looks more vintage. Several of you have asked about the water service here and uh, the answer is yes, we did get it turned on. It turned out that the valve was out at the street inside the meter box, which is pretty typical. Uh, it's just that the valve itself was buried in the dirt and we, we didn't see it there. But the man from the city, he knew exactly where it was and he shoved his tool down in there and he turned it and everything was good after that. So we do have water service now. And uh, as far as we can tell, nothing is leaking and we're holding pressure on gas, we're holding pressure on water. 
Um, and now that we have water in the P-trap, we're not getting fumes. So, so that's great. And uh, we're just ready now for the laundry equipment. But let's continue setting up the house and getting things cleaned up. Next up is mouse traps. Welcome to the 1834 Restoration House Kitchen. This is where culinary magic will someday occur. But for now, we're doing mouse traps. So forget about the glue traps, the sticky traps, the fancy traps, the ones that cost a lot of money and promise the moon. Just get yourself a bunch of these cheap Victor mouse traps. They've been around forever and they still work. So this is how we do it. Take off the little staple, pull back this wire right here. These are very, very touchy. Let me show you how touchy they are. So little mouse comes along and, and he tries to get a nibble of that. They usually will put their paws on there and uh, try to raise up over it. And there it goes, dead mouse. So I'll go ahead and reset it one more time just so you can see what's happening. Put this back over here. Make sure you keep a good hold on this at all times because it will snap you if you're not careful. Put that under there like so. Have to hold up on it. It's kind of a tricky, you almost need three hands to do this, it seems, but, but it does work. All right, there we are. Now just let that sit and don't disturb it. And uh, if there's a mouse in the house, You'll probably get them. Time to clean up the mouse turds. Well, this is interesting. So this box right here actually has an open bottom. It goes all the way underneath this cabinet. And there's probably a hole under there somewhere and the mice are just coming right up inside. Let's put a couple of mouse traps in here and see if we can catch the boogers. Scary. Be very careful when you handle these things. <laughs> Otherwise that could happen. All right, let's see if we can reset this thing without getting in trouble here. Seriously, don't be afraid of these things, but do respect them. So now we have two mouse traps facing different directions. I'm closing this back up to make it dark. Hopefully we catch something or better yet, hopefully there's nothing to catch. This old cupboard here was completely full of mouse turds, top to bottom, so I vacuumed them out. But I'd like to show you how they're getting in there. So back in the corner there is a place where an electrician drilled to put a wire through. So that small hole was big enough for a mouse to come through. I left a screwdriver back there so that you can see for scale how small that hole is. It doesn't take much. A small mouse can squeeze her body into a real tight space and get right in there. So that needs to be closed up. But first thing, we need to get rid of the mouse. If there is any, we need to kill them all and trap them. And then we'll close that up. Our plaster walls are dirty. They don't look dirty, but they are. They have years of dust and dirt. We went through this at our last house up in New York where the walls were in need of cleaning. So what we ended up doing is we got this stuff called TSP. It's called trisodium phosphate. They have phosphate free, which seems kind of weird if it's TSP, how can it be TS without the P, but somehow they made it work. But they do have the regular stuff, which is TSP with the phosphate. And that's really probably the good stuff. Now, what you do is you mix that according to the box and make a solution. And what that does is it breaks the oil, the dirt, the grease, uh, anything that's on the wall that needs to come off is going to come off. And so we're going to use a Swiffer and just get it wet and we'll just scrub that wall a few times and we'll probably have to change pads several times throughout the process. Janie is here with a, a glove. Show them the glove. Yes. She's mixing it up and getting it all dissolved. Never do it with your bare hands. Now, the stuff is caustic. You don't want to get it on your skin. You don't want to get it on your clothes. Definitely don't get it in your eyes. And for those of you who are wondering, what will it do to plaster? Good question. Well, lime is caustic. 
TSP is caustic, so they're compatible. Um, there's no problem whatsoever. If this were acidic and you put it on caustic lime, guess what's going to happen? It's going to dissolve it. So because this is on the same end of the pH spectrum, it'll be just fine. Nothing ever goes smooth here at 1834 Restoration House. So we tried to get the crystals to dissolve in the bucket. They weren't dissolving. And we reread the label and it said to put it in hot water. Well, okay, great. So we, we dump it out and we go to get some hot water out of the tap. There is no hot water. We have water, but it's not hot. So something's going on with the water heater. I go around the house and I check the circuit breakers. They're all on. I looked in the fuse box. Yes, we have a fuse box. Uh, the fuses all look good and the, uh, the big, uh, you know, Frankenstein style knife switches, they're all pushed up and turned on the way they're supposed to. So anyway, more mysteries to solve. We've got to figure out what's going on with that hot water heater. Um, there is a possibility it may have burned out because when the water was turned off, if it boiled all the water away, the water heater element gets uncovered and then it could actually shatter from excessive heat. So let's hope that's not the case. We did find another heater element on the ground next to it. So who knows, maybe this has happened once before. But one more mystery to solve. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't bring any of my electrical testing equipment, so we have no way of troubleshooting it at this time. So we'll catch that on the next video, hopefully. But you know what? It's past noon. I think it's time to stop and have some lunch. There's no sense wasting time. So we went to the local Lowe's, which is uh, a good hike from here, but we picked up an electrical test kit. So we have the outlet tester, multimeter, and a touchless energy sensor. Now, I want to show you something about this, this meter. So this is your typical cobalt brand from Lowe's, but I thought it was interesting how the factory put the hold button on upside down. Now this is the, the touchless voltage sensor. So what it does is it tries to pick up energy fields from, from AC wiring. So you turn it on, it beeps, gives you a light, now, when you come close to the energy, it beeps and turns red. The trouble with this thing is it's too sensitive. I'm about six inches away and it's already going off. I'll show you why that's a problem in a second. Okay, the other way is with the receptacle tester. I plug it in. There's three lights here. There's a red light and there's two amber lights. What I'm getting right now is a single amber light. So we'll pull it out and we'll look up the code here and it says open ground. Wow. Well, so why is open ground a problem? Well, this round lug here is usually grounded in modern electrical systems, but here somebody put a three prong outlet in a place where it should have been a two prong because there is no electrical ground. So if you take something in here and you plug it in with the expectation that it's grounded, and you have some kind of issue here with something falling in the sink? Yeah, so that's a problem. The third way is with the meter itself. I'll set it on a range that's the next higher voltage from what we're trying to measure. So we're looking for 120 volts, which is the North American Electrical System standard. I have it set on 200. So I'll put the probes in the socket. I'm reading 122.3 volts which is pretty close to where it should be. Let me show you why high sensitivity is a problem. Okay, in here, there's a few old circuits. There's some fuses and some wires. Watch this. I get close. I'm already going off. I'm about a foot away from those wires. And the thing is, I have no way of identifying which one is hot and which one's not because it's already going off. Let's take a look at some of the electrical circuits here and see what we've got going. So this looks like the master disconnect switch. Now, there is a breaker panel outside the house that uh, is more modern, but this is some of the older stuff. So I'm gonna check across here. This looks like a, uh, a double leg circuit here. So we're probably going to see about 240 volts across here. And we have 237, yes. 237, okay. On the other side, we should see the same thing. Yes. 
237. Okay, so those fuses are good. The disconnect switch is working. Okay, let's check this box here. Okay, that voltage comes from this box and comes into this sub box. All right, so I'm going to check it again. Voltage in. 236. And voltage out. This is on the back side of the fuses. 236. Okay, so fuses are good. So we know that's working. This one's a little bit cramped here. Okay. 237. And then on the output side. 236. Okay, so that's working. All right, so everything in this panel is good. Let's check these others over here. Okay, this looks like a, uh, a knife switch with fuses on it. 119. Okay, so it's 120 volts basically going through a knife switch and, and a pair of fuses. Now it's interesting for you electrical guys, look at this. You have the, the hot and the neutral both fused. Okay, we never do that today. Never, ever. We only fuse the hot side. Okay, here's another one. 119. Okay, and let's check this bus here. 117. Okay, and this one? 118, 119. All right, and this one here. 118. Okay, so all the circuits in there are working properly. Clearly, we have some electrical work to do. <laughs> yes. And now this is kind of mysterious. We have this mechanical time clock here, and I have no idea why this is here in a house. Um, I do have a theory, though. Let's check this voltage real quick. That's the load side. Is there anything there? Negative. Okay, that means it's turned off. Which the dial is in the off position. Right, so, so it that should makes be. sense. There's a big mercury vapor yard light out back, and I have a feeling that that's probably connected to this time clock here. Okay, I'm going to take you guys outside and we'll look at the circuit breaker panel. We're outside the house now, and I'm going to open up the breaker panel. There really isn't much going on here. We've got uh, a couple of big, uh, you know, three three large breakers that are ganged together. So uh, it could be any number of things. But let's let's see if we can identify it. Porch. Can't read that. Kitchen. Something, so sewer, kitchen sewer. I have no idea what that means. The rest of these are unmarked. So what good does that do if you don't know what the breakers are? But as far as what we're doing today, all of the breakers are in the on position. Let me just make sure they're not tripped. No, no, no. Whoop. I don't know what that was, but I just turned it off. Um, so everything else is in good shape here. So. I can't see any reason why the water heater wouldn't be working. Oh, there's a, a wasp over there, kind of giving me the eye. Well, let's just stay away from her. We'll take care of her later. We're under the house again. It's not my favorite place to be, but you know, sometimes you gotta do what you gotta do. So this is the water heater. Now remember the tester is super sensitive, so I've got the thing turned on. And these look like the electrical wires that go into the water heater. And they don't exactly look like code approved cabling. But let's see what we've got here. I have no energy going into this water heater at all. So it shut down somewhere. So next thing I wanna do is trace it. Let's see where it goes. It goes to this really sketchy looking junction right here. Three wire nuts. They're not even inside a, a box. 
So they should be inside a junction box with a cover on it. That is not good. It heads off in that direction. Let's have a look here. Let's see what's going on. Okay, yeah, so the cable comes back here. It goes over that way. And I don't understand where it's going or why, but we'll find out here in a second. I don't know if you folks can see me, but I'm crawling way back here in the darkness. So this cable goes there and it goes up through the floor. And there's a bunch of cables running together. So I would have to guess that it's probably coming up there where all those fuse boxes are. It's black and it's the rightmost cable as it comes up through the floor. So let's go up there and take another look. Okay, here's what we know so far. We know that there's no energy on the wires going to the water heater. We know that it goes to a, a round black cable that goes up through the floor. And we know that there's two of them that, which are identical. Well, we just found two cables that are round and they're identical. And right there, they're black. So to me, it looks like this time clock here was used to control the water heater and the hours in which it would run. Now, why? Again, why do that? Nobody ever does that. They're supposed to be thermostatically controlled and they, they set their own temperature based on what you set it to. All right, let's take a look here and see if there's any energy in here. Okay, that's good, we have energy. Looks like we have two phases, but nothing there. Okay, so I'm gonna close this back up. And I'm gonna grab this manual override switch. Yeah, just put it into override. Let's see if there's any energy on it now. Circuit's now energized. So I should be able to go down below and if we got the right circuit, there'll be energy on those wires. I was looking the circuit over here and here's a cable that heads that direction over towards the circuit breaker box. Now, somebody did some kind of hillbilly fly wire thing here with wire nuts, again, outside of a junction box. And then it goes to this, this round black cable. And remember, there's two of them. Both of those go up to that time clock. But it almost appears to me as if this cable came here and then went on over to the water heater. So let's see what we've got now. Okay, this was dead a few minutes ago. Oh, look at that. Now we have energy going to the water heater. Let's go over to the water heater itself, try it there. There it is. So now there's energy to the water heater. So if the elements are good, this thing should come on and start warming up the water. Somebody at some point in the past must have interrupted the circuit to the water heater and ran it up here to this time clock so that they could make the water heater come on at certain hours and go off at certain hours, probably thinking that that was going to save energy and save money. Well, here's the problem with that. So when you have water in a steady state, steady temperature, it takes very little energy to maintain it there. But if you allow it to cool off and come back down to ambient temperature, now it takes a whole lot of energy to get that water heat back up where it was. So in all likelihood, this probably didn't save any money. In fact, it may have ended up costing more, possibly. But now we have power to the water heater. All we have to do now is wait a while and we'll see if the water heat comes up. If it doesn't, then we'll have to repair something else. Whoa, that was weird. Hmm. Strange. It's been about 20 minutes since we came up from underneath the house. We had a little snack just to kill some time. So let's see if there's any hot water here. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, that's hot water. All right, we got it. 
and we didn't have to spend a dime doing it. Now that we have hot water, we can mix up our TSP in hot water and it'll dissolve better. While we were at Lowe's getting the meter, they have the real TSP. We couldn't get that stuff up in New York. We're inside the blue room now. And the reason that we made the TSP solution is very simple. These walls are completely covered in mildew. It's all over the place. Go ahead and do a tight shot here. You can see spots of mildew everywhere. Now the house sat vacant for a long time. Moisture got in here and we went through hot seasons and cold seasons and mildew just loves to grow under those conditions. So we're going to take the TSP solution and we'll completely scrub and wash the walls down with TSP and then we'll come back and rinse it with clear water and that'll kill everything and make it nice and clean. While I was going around the room pulling out picture hangers, I thought that the nails came out awfully easy. And so I started paying a little bit closer attention to it and I realized that there was a white powdery substance coming off on the nail. And then I started picking at it a little bit and I found paper. Well, that explains the mildew. You see, plaster will not mildew. But look at this. You see how the reveal on this molding is really thin? That's not plaster. Somebody put drywall in this room. They completely covered what was here with drywall. Uh, we think maybe Possibly the entire room is drywalled for some reason. So very likely there's probably some broken plaster and lath underneath all of this that needs some attention. But remember, plaster will not mildew. So why did this room mildew and the others didn't? Because somebody put drywall in here. Drywall will mildew every time under those conditions, but plaster will not. Give it a good scrub. I can see the dirt and stuff coming off already. Wow. Oh yeah, look at that. Can you see all that dirt? It's interesting that we found drywall in here, but it does give us an opportunity to do something. And that is, because it's not plaster, we can go ahead and paint over it. And why would we want to do that? Well, because we need a place that we can, can retreat to. This will be our space that we're going to basically live in this room, and we want it to be clean and fresh. Now, later on, we'll go back and we'll take this drywall off of here, and we'll put it back to plaster, and probably do some kind of a period type of wallpaper and really make it look good, natural finished wood, and we're just gonna do a really nice job. But for now, this will be the place we live in and it needs to be clean and fresh. Why don't you talk about that? Why is that so important? Well, when we were up in 1834 Restoration House, uh, we didn't do any cosmetic anything until the very end when we had to because the realtor insisted we need to clean it up a bit. It's not very good condition looking, and the walls look dirty. They were. And we realized after doing all of that cosmetic stuff how much better we felt emotionally and mentally. We were more eager to get more done mm -hmm. and didn't realize how much those dirty walls everywhere was affecting us until the end. The entire interior of the house downstairs was painted a kind of a dingy, almost uh, beige color. And it was extremely dirty. Oh. And it actually was a little bit smelly too. But we went back and we painted that right before we sold it. We'd painted it to the brightest white we could get. Chantilly Lace from Benjamin Moore, little plug there. And we used a historic color out of the Benjamin Moore collection, which was that blue greenish color we put on the trims. Now, several people criticized us for painting those trims. Well, the thing is, we had to. We had to leave, we didn't have time to restore it properly. Right. And so that's why we did that. But here we are, we will come back. We'll make this room perfect. We'll put natural finished wood, we'll put plaster, and probably some kind of historic wallpaper on that. That would be wonderful.
Yeah. But we do need that space to retreat to where we can get away from the dust, the dirt, the grime, and have that one space in the house where, where it's always clean and always fresh. Yes, and since this is going to be our bedroom, it really needs to be a relaxing place and it needs to be comfortable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's cleaning up nice. It is, for the most part, anyway. It still needs painting, though. You can see a lot of blemishes and stuff in there. And I don't like that. But it is cleaning up nice. And I do look forward to painting it. Well, here's the wall after we cleaned it. What a huge difference it makes. Very much. Yeah. I think it would be more pleasant to be in a room that's clean like that. So we decided, we talked about it. In fact, we were both thinking about it independently without talking about it. but. Uh, she asked me what color which should we paint this, which was exactly what I was thinking too. But we decided, just to keep things simple, we'll go ahead and paint the same color in this room. That way we don't have to mess with anything else and it will all look good. The fireplace has got yeah. crumbling paint all around it. Right. I really don't want to take that off right now. Yep. So we'll just keep it the same color so that we don't have to mess with that. I think we've done enough work for one day, so uh, we're going to end it right here. Thanks for watching 1834 Restoration House, and please leave your comments below. We'd love to talk to you. If you like what you've seen, please like and subscribe. See you in the next video.